Hi, I'm Scott. I'm supposed to do a guest lecture, so I guess I will get started on that. One thing that I think is important um, to do for anyone working in computer music is to look at various uh, topics in the history of electronic music and computer music. Um, much of this is really just for historical interest, and you wouldn't necessarily want to uh, directly use these ideas in your music, but I think it's very helpful to try to understand what people were doing and what they were going for. A lot of these things are obscure and not really that well known, but they're documented in things like journal articles um, and various publications, masters and PhD theses and so on. One of the things that I think speaks to the advantages of using something like pure data is the stuff that Warren Burt wrote about. He's got a lot of uh, historical stuff on his website, including uh, I think his master's thesis, and it shows what he was thinking about and what he was trying to do, and I think this is pretty relevant for working on uh, stuff in pure data. For his master's thesis, he built a um, custom uh, synthesizer, it was sort of a hybrid analog digital thing, which you can see here. And there's the inside of it. And the idea was that this was sort of a performance instrument that included a number of quirks and random processes that would semi-autonomously generate sound. It was inspired in part by the Sal Mar construction. This was built for Sal Martirano in the late 60s and early 70s. And this is, of course, a very large <clears throat> instrument. It's a hybrid analog digital thing that's controlled by a bunch of touch switches. These aren't mechanical switches. You just touch them to turn them on and off. And this controls a bunch of logic circuits <clears throat> that implement a number of random processes and sequencers and things like that. And this controls some analog tone generator stuff, which I think is up here. So the idea is that the performer uses these to control the sound generation, but to some degree it's automated and randomized, so it's not entirely deterministic. You can listen to it here if you want. I don't think the sound is um, really the best thing ever, but I think what's notable about it is that it seems to offer very good control over the density and the form of the sound. These can be uh, varied quite spontaneously, which is kind of, I think, a problem with things like analog modular synthesizers. And you can easily get the impression that the design is kind of intentionally eccentric and um, unusual. Actually, other than Sal Martirano, I don't think anybody could really properly understand it or perform very well with it. I think the key points in the Warren Burt master's thesis are summarized here. Um, so the advantages that he was going for for the um, synthesizer that he made was accessibility. Um, basically he didn't want to be tied to any kind of um, university electronic music studio and he wanted something that he could use whenever and wherever he wanted. I don't think this is really a big issue anymore because if you're doing this kind of thing with a computer, you've of course got access to it and you don't really need anybody else's studio. Um, this point I think is kind of the most important. And, um, a machine with its own set of idiosyncrasies cannot help but have a unique sound and demand unique methods of working with those sounds. And if the composer is designing the machine, he can assure that the idiosyncrasies inherent in the machine match his own peculiar set of compositional whimsies. <clears throat> I think this is the biggest advantage of using something like Pure Data or Max. Um, although I would like to add to that point that the composer has to carefully evaluate the um, capabilities and behavior of what they're making because I think it's kind of easy to get uh, maybe overly seduced by ideas that don't work all that well in practice. So it's important to take a critical look at what you're doing and 
evaluate whether or not that's really working. Um, and the advantage actually of pure data over designing something in hardware is that you can design it sort of iteratively and continuously revise it and update it to fit your desires as they change over time. Advantage 3, by building the machine himself, the composer acquires an intimate knowledge of the method of the production of sound. Such intimate knowledge is almost essential if one wishes to shape the sound in an intelligent manner. Therefore, this building becomes as important a compositional procedure as any other. I think, again, that's very relevant to making things in pure data. Um, for economy, um, well, you don't really have to actually build something now. You can just use cheap or free software with a computer that you probably already have. Uh, five, political freedom. Well, I don't think that's all that relevant now. I think it works better to say now that you're not dependent on anyone to rehearse or perform your compositions because you can do everything yourself. I always thought it was kind of discouraging to see people writing instrumental compositions and either never have them performed or only have a one-off poorly rehearsed performance that wasn't recorded or was poorly recorded. Um, I think this autonomy point is extremely important, but I think the bigger issue is that it's personal autonomy and independence from anyone else, um, any performance space or anything like that. You can produce finished sounding recordings completely on your own. So the idiosyncrasies that Warren Burt built into his system <clears throat> went as far as um, constructing uh, a series of digital to analog converters. These are based on R2R resistor ladders. And he would intentionally uh, change the values of the resistors in a non-deterministic fashion by physically crushing them, um, which I think is kind of interesting, kind of a nice way to introduce some degree of indeterminacy to the process. In pure data, of course, you can randomize pretty much everything. When I say that things should be idiosyncratic, though, I don't mean that they should be um, unusable, uncontrollable, or intentionally obscure. Um, Peter Blasser makes these modular synthesizer things, and nothing is labeled, and I don't know, it's supposed to encourage exploration, but I think it goes a little too far in the intentionally obscure direction. Um, I think his circuit designs are kind of brilliant, but I'd prefer for something to operate the way that I'd want it to. Another notable thing is the Copenier synthesizer at the GRM studio. Um, this is the portable model that was built later. The original one is this. Apparently Pierre Schaeffer, who uh, commissioned the design, didn't want composers to use it in a way that, for example, specified exact frequencies and durations and so on, the way that composers like Stockhausen worked. He encouraged composers to instead make the sounds by ear, um, which, he comp which he called composing through listening. And so to that end, the controls don't have any numeric labels on them, so that the composer is forced to pick basically an arbitrary value that sounded the best. And I think that's a better way to kind of be obscure and idiosyncratic without being completely unusable. You can't really document and reproduce something, but that's sort of the point. In pure data, I like to approach this by using a lot of randomization. Uh, that may be continuous random variables, that may be uh, large numbers of different things that are all randomized at the same time, or things that are randomized when the patch is started, or whatever. I don't really have any set methods for doing this. The randomization includes things like patterns, timbres, effects, mixing, and so on. Um, really, I like to randomize as many things as possible. Um, although this becomes quite a challenge because many different combinations of random variables might result in an undesirable sound, I can live to some degree with things that aren't exactly the way that I want, but it's important to find a balance between something that's kind of boring and overly specific and something that's too chaotic that never really does what you want it to do. I think it's important when working in Max or Pure Data or whatever to find a good workflow.
I think a lot of people want to make an interface that resembles conventional music software or VSTs or piano roll sequencers or 16 step sequencers or things like that and I don't think that's really a great way to approach it um, the reason is that one it's it can be quite difficult to implement specifically if you want to um, have things like storage and retrieval of preset sound sequences and so on and second I think the results are overly limiting if you want to make something flexible you kind of have to foresee all the ways that you're going to want to use it uh, before you actually make something and I've always found that kind of an impossible situation to deal with I can't really anticipate all the ways that I want to use something and everything ends up being overly complicated and if I try to do that I never finish it so I think it makes more sense to make things that are relatively fixed like abstractions um, for things that are difficult to just put together like um, reverberation um, pitch shifting some kinds of oscillators and filters and so on but for the rest of it the sequencing, the sound generation, the, the specific voice architecture that I want to synthesize a sound and so on. All of that I usually do in pretty much an ad hoc manner according to whatever goals I have for the music that I'm working on and I've approached abstractions in a way that I think are kind of helpful for that. For example one thing I like to do is use one abstraction as a controller that can control remotely a number of different other abstractions. So this is what I use as a random modulator. Now this is the thing that actually does the modulation and you can make a large number of them and control them from a single common user interface. Now these are linked by this dollar sign one um, argument. And you can also make separate ones that are controlled by a separate user interface. So these are two different abstractions. This is the audio object. It's got the tilde. And this is the controller. Now, this isn't a very good abstraction. It's one of the first ones I made. And it kind of illustrates I think some cautionary um, things that you should be careful of. Um, the problems are that one, these parameters are not labeled well, and I still don't really understand what some of them do that well. And so some of these things I don't really use. So it would be better to just omit some of them. Um, and second, each of these parameters is controlled by a separate inlet, which for some purposes that can be convenient, but it's kind of a pain in other ways. So there's an inlet for each of these parameters, but I don't know, I don't think it's that useful. I made some better abstractions later, like this one. This is a sort of modular filter bank. And I think it's better designed, although it still has some things that aren't that great about it. Um, the idea here is similar, that this object is the actual audio filter, and this is the controller. And you can make as many of these as you want. So if you want an 8-band filter bank, then you can put a signal into all 8 of these and sum the outputs together. And you can send a bang to these inlets and randomize them or you can send uh, a number to explicitly set the frequency. And this is controlled in a much better way. These um, parameters are actually usefully named and to set them you can send messages like this. I'm controlling these parameters using this param in abstraction that I made. Basically what it does is it appends a dollar sign zero and a dash 
to the beginning of the parameter name which you're sending to this object and then it appends an underscore to the end and then sends the name and then the value to uh, whatever is receiving it. So the convention that I use which is completely arbitrary and may or may not be that useful is that for each of these controls I've got for the receive it's got a dollar sign zero dash then the parameter name then an underscore and I'm setting those here this is basically the presets and that's sending it to dollar sign one dash parameter name and the thing that I stupidly didn't understand for a while is that you really want the um, send name and the uh, label to be the same because otherwise it's not really very useful from a user interface perspective and so the parameters are received here this is the tilde object um, that process the processes the audio the parameters are named with the dollar sign one dash parameter name so they can communicate remotely in that fashion the controller abstraction uses local names um, for presets and for the parameter inputs and then it sends using this dollar sign one argument to the abstraction that's processing the audio and this has some amount of um, local uh, sends and receives also I think that works reasonably well this way you don't have namespace conflicts now this is pretty flexible because you can set the filter order for each band I think it goes from one to four um, and there's smoothing over time for the filter frequencies which you can set with this time constant thing the problems are that I added this other stuff which isn't really that useful and so I usually just turn those off it's supposed to have a separate delay for each um, band of the filter bank which is randomized alongside the um, filter frequencies and it's supposed to also have a random polarity. I'm using a, an all-pass filter so that I can continuously interpolate between positive one and negative one without attenuating the signal. But that part actually doesn't work that well, so I never use it. Um, I probably should have thought it out a little better before finalizing it. But in general, I think this works pretty well. And something that I found about electroacoustic music, for example the stuff made at the GRM studio, is that it relies very very heavily on filter banks. If you look at photos of pretty much any music concrete or electroacoustic mu music studio from the 50s or 60s or whatever, you can see these things. They were used in almost all of them. I figured out what they were at one point and I forgot what they were called, but these are filter banks. This has however many bands in a certain frequency range and this one extends the low end and the high end. So they're used together. Now a filter bank kind of superficially resembles a graphic equalizer but they don't really work the same way. A graphic equalizer traditionally uses a number of peaking filters in series. Those are um, filters with an adjustable boost or cut and if you set them to zero it doesn't affect the signal. A filter bank in contrast is a series of bandpass filters um, that are in parallel when they're summed together. When these are turned all the way down the signal is completely attenuated and when they're turned all the way up you don't actually get the original signal back. It's kind of um, weird sounding. Now modern software implementations of graphic equalizers actually work more like this. You can in some cases attenuate each band all the way down to zero, um, but when they're turned all the way up they do sum back to the original signal. That's a lot easier to do with uh, digital filtering, but these um, analog ones usually considerably transform the signal when they're being used. Um, a notable thing though is that these all have fixed frequencies and they are uh, uniformly spaced so it's three bands per octave or something like that typically um, but when you're doing it in pure data you can 
randomize all the frequencies, you can change them over time, etc. You can easily patch together something like this. This isn't really particularly interesting, but it demonstrates what you can do with a filter bank. So this is stereo with 8 bands per channel. Um, I don't think using this noise is particularly interesting. I usually like to make something that's more of a crackly kind of sound. Um, I tend to like natural sounds a lot, and I think that one of the most interesting sounds is things that are basically noise, but have an interesting variation over time. For example, leaves blowing across pavement or something like that. It's actually very difficult to synthesize sounds like that, and I spend a lot of time experimenting with that kind of thing. So I can give an example of that. So here's something I threw together really quickly. I changed the number of bands to 16 per channel. I changed the parameters a little bit, and I made this noise generator thing different. Um, this has a threshold that's variable, and when the noise, which is a uniform random variable, exceeds this threshold. Um, this is now called a Bernoulli distribution rather than a uniform distribution. It uh, triggers a sample and hold that samples a different noise signal and it sounds like this. Now that's fairly basic and not really all that interesting but it illustrates one, an easy incorporation of randomization uh, to a user interface that is modular and easily extensible and doesn't really attempt to mimic anything like a VST or something like that. Um, and three, a thing that I think is also very important, you need to pay attention to uh, control laws because a lot of things don't really work in a completely linear predictable manner. So for example this controls the density of the noise. If you set it to zero it's completely off that sets this to one and since this is a uniform distribution from minus one to one it doesn't ever um, it's never greater than one. So you can change this to have a low density and a high density and if you set it to 1000, it's basically just equivalent to... no. Well, it's still doing the sample and hold, so it's not really the same as white noise. <clears throat> um, anyway, it's if you want to vary this over time, for example, you need to pay a lot of attention to this control law, and maybe this should be, like, exponential or something because it's much more sensitive on the low end here than on the high end. And so it's very important, I think, to have a working knowledge of things like statistics, specifically the way that multiple random variables combine together. Um, it's important to have some knowledge of uh, perceptual processes so you understand uh, what kinds of control laws you should use for things like amplitudes, frequencies, delays, durations, and so on. Um, a way that I like to do it is like this. Say that you want something to be randomly distributed between a high value and a low value. This can get you an exponential distribution between a specified high and low value, and this is good for things like durations and delay times. So this I patched together very quickly. Um, it's the kind of thing that I use all the time. Say that you want to have a duration or something between 10 and 1000 milliseconds. If you use a uniform distribution, the expected value will be around 500 milliseconds, which is perceptually not really that useful. If it's an exponential distribution, the expected value will be more like 100 milliseconds. Um, and you can see when you repeatedly click this that it's 
much more biased to smaller values. Um, the idea here is that this generates not quite a continuous random variable, but close enough, and it's scaled to the range of 0 to 1, and then you are scaling that by the log of the range of these two values, and then adding the log of the minimum value, and then exponentiating that. And I think that something like this is, is very useful and very handy because if you use a simple uniform random distribution for things like this, it's not really going to work very well. So this is another big thing to pay attention to. Another major ingredient of electroacoustic music and um, music concrete is pitch shifters, um, especially some fairly esoteric ones like this. Um, this is a quite elaborate pitch shifter and digital delay thing made around 1978. It can be controlled with an external keyboard like this, and it can actually hold the uh, delay contents in memory, and then you can set a start point and an end point and traverse through the memory at an adjustable speed thus implementing something like time stretching or maybe kind of a crude form of granular synthesis. So you can have independent control of both pitch and speed. Now this was used um, a great deal by Francois Bale, and you can hear it in this composition. He goes pretty crazy with it. Um, you can listen to that on your own if you'd like to. Um, I'm pretty sure that's what he's using. I'm not absolutely certain, but it seems very likely. Now, earlier pitch shifters like the Eventide H910, for example, um, splice at a regular rate. And what that means is that to implement a pitch shift, you have to write a signal to delay memory and read it out at a different rate. And at some point, because you don't have an infinite amount of delay time and because you want to do actual uh, time scale pitch modification rather than just playing a recording faster or slower, um, the signal has to be spliced. The easiest way to do this is to splice the signal at a constant rate. Um, thus it has two read pointers and it's continuously cross-fading between them. Um, this works sort of well, but the problem is that this can introduce some dissonance if pitch shifting by a large amount. And also there's a trade-off between the um, length of the delay and the quality of the output. At shorter delay times, you hear more um, modulation effects and more artifacts. At longer delay times, there's a longer latency between the input and the output. I can demonstrate that here. So what I made here is a simple tone generator. That does not sound very interesting at all. And I made a crude pitch shifter. This basically just um, repackages one of the example patches. It's um, G09. The problem is that if you put a continuous tone through it, you can hear this sort of modulation. But, with this you can demonstrate some interesting effects. In particular, you can make a reverse delay. Um, that's why I used this sound, so that you can hear if it's forwards or reverse. That's kind of boring, so I made it marginally more interesting by randomizing some stuff. Uh, I copied and pasted this thing that I described earlier, and that controls the um, window length, which um, determines the crossfade time. It's also got feedback. I could randomize that too, maybe. 
So I just copied and pasted that again. Well, it's still not that exciting. Um, anyway, more advanced pitch shifters, instead of splicing at a constant rate and crossfading like this, they would um, splice at zero crossings or use autocorrelation to find better splice points. And so in doing that, if you put a constant tone through it, you don't get that um, amplitude modulation effect. And so that's what this actually does. It's doing some kind of autocorrelation and finding a good splice point for that where the um, original signal and the uh, destination signal are strongly correlated with each other. Now, I don't have any fancy way to do that in pure data. That's actually rather difficult. But I implemented some weird pitch shifting stuff of my own. Um, I thought of kind of an eccentric and unusual design. And so that's here. And so the idea here is that it doesn't actually uh, splice at all. It plays the signal alternately. Um, forwards and in reverse. So the idea is that depending on how you're moving the read pointer through the delay line, you can play this signal forwards at some arbitrary um, different pitch factor, or you can play it in reverse. And so the idea is that if you're only pitch shifting up, then you can go forwards moving the um, read point toward the right point, or you can go in reverse, shifting up by the same factor, moving the read point away from the right point, and if you do those alternately, then you can get back to where you started, and you don't have to splice to a different point. Um, I incorporated, as usual, randomization into this, so you can get different effects this way. And it sounds like this. Well, that's a particularly uninteresting sound to be processing, and I just did it to demonstrate how pitch shifting works, but if you do this, maybe it'll be better. Well, that's not great, but it's kind of interesting. <clears throat> um, so that's the kind of stuff that I frequently do. Um, this abstraction, uh, the parameter stuff, works the same as the, uh, the filter bank one. It uses the same um, parameter input thing. So, for example, if I want to set some initial parameters, 
that um, filter thing is an anti-aliasing filter, um, and if you turn it off, there's more uh, aliasing when you pitch shift up by a lot. This thing I added here is a multi-tap delay. Um, this user interface kind of sucks because I didn't understand when I made it that you want to have the parameter names the same as they're um, labeled here. So if you want to edit this, you have to go inside it and use these names here. I don't know why it didn't occur to me to make it more usable. But I have a lot of stuff like this that's kind of old and not really broken, but kind of not all that usable. And so I would encourage anyone who's developing new abstractions to maybe try to think ahead a little more than I did. This one isn't very good either um, for similar reasons. The idea that I'm going for here is that for each of these abstractions, you can make them, um, well, like the like the Warren Burt Masters thesis said, kind of idiosyncratic, like this pitch shifter that alternately goes forward and in reverse. Um, I don't think anyone's done that before. Um, it's heavily reliant on randomization, and so in a lot of ways, it in a lot of ways, it kind of just does its own thing without a lot of. Um, user intervention required. Um, these are relatively small and simple things and you can patch them together in a modular sort of fashion as I did with this filter bank. Um, and so that's kind of what I'm going for here. They're controlled by these kinds of messages which um, by the way if you wanted to automate something like this you could randomize any of these things too um, and that's that's relatively easy. You can, I think, make a message like um, this. That should work, I think. Yeah. So these things can be easily randomized and automated as well. All right, I cleaned this patch up a little bit and made it a little bit better. It's still not great, but um, it's okay for having thrown it together in a few minutes. This is what it sounds like now. By the way, I forgot to mention that the 1,000 that I typed here, and here, and here, and the 200 that I typed here is because those set the maximum length of the delay lines um, when the abstraction is created. Um, I have a different example of a delay thing that I tried to make kind of similar to this. <coughs> Instead of reading through the delay in a normal fashion, <coughs> it randomly reads little segments and crossfades between them, and so it's got a sort of um, start point that changes smoothly over time and then it adds some randomization to that so it can read on either side of it so that attempt to produce something sort of like this part where you latch something into the delay memory um, although it actually doesn't hold something in the delay memory it um, it continuously reads through it and so that's this patch. It's not really as general as a grain delay because usually in a grain delay you can vary the pitch as well. I used it for uh, a composition recently and I haven't released it yet but I hope to soon and it sounds like this. <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't know how audible that really is there, but <clears throat> the point was that I was taking a bunch of percussive sounds and writing that to a very large delay buffer and then using this uh, technique to kind of scan through it in a way that's um, smooth and not glitchy. This is a simple patch that I put together to demonstrate this delay thing. This is the scale here, um, 300, 500, 400, 450, 350. This is in hertz, so basically this is the 6th harmonic, the 10th harmonic, the 8th harmonic, the 9th harmonic, and the 7th harmonic. It's a harmonic series scale. Um, and you can make them really easily like this. You can just find the pitches by ear. And the whole thing sounds like this. This can be easily broken down into several different parts. This part, um, every other um, bang from the metro, it increments this by one or four. So this random thing here, one time out of three, it'll pick a different number. So if it's incrementing by one, then it's just going zero, one, two, three, four. And if it's incrementing by four, then that's the um, complement of one in mod five arithmetic. So it's going four, three, two, one, zero. And that's reading the comp contents of this table, changing the pitch of the oscillator. Now, this is a thing that I typically do. Um, it's uh, simple wave shaping. So there are two envelopes that I'm adding together. This is just a simple thing that I made to um, emulate exponential, exponentially decaying envelopes. So there's two parts here. This is the main portion of it here. And then I made this much shorter one to make the attack more percussive and pronounced. I think that's an important thing to do with um, distortion synthesis, like wave shaping or FM. It's important to emphasize that attack. And then it's just going through a, um, another abstraction I made. This is very simple. It's just a sigmoid curve. So that's the actual wave shaper part. Um, you can, of course, make that a lot fancier if you want to. Uh, and here's the other part. So this doesn't use this clock divider stage, so it's twice the tempo. Um, there's a counter that goes to three, and then each time that hits zero, it decrements this counter, adds the two together, um, and this is mod five, so it's kind of shifting this sequence zero, one, two, by one each time. I don't really understand how that works, but I like the effect. And then it's reading the sequence, and then it's playing that an octave higher, and then the wave shaper part is exactly the same. So it's two of the same things here. And then that's going through this delay thing. Now this is scanning through the delay at kind of an arbitrary rate that may go um, forwards or backwards. And it's splitting the sound up into little grains, and the size of those grains varies. And they're smoothly crossfaded together. And also each time it reads um, from the, the read point of the delay, there's some randomization added to that. And all of these things change randomly over time, um, both the read position, the grain size, and the amount of randomness. I was going to put the microphone through it, but I didn't think the effect was very good. So if I put that through a multi-tap delay, it sounds a little more distant and reverberant. And if I add the original sequence to it, it sounds like that. 
Now, that's again a very simple thing that I just came up with in a few minutes. But doing that kind of thing and paying more attention to it can, of course, um, result in much more sophisticated sounding things. Uh, I need to preset the parameters for this. So that's how I do this because I didn't design this in any kind of intelligent way. I can take the ones that I changed and say ER1RT. I also recommend naming the parameters much more helpful things than this. I did this because I thought it would be a good idea to save space, but it's actually a much better idea to be verbose if it's actually um, easy to understand how something works. I wanted it to be nice and compact, but there's not really much advantage to that. So now those will be this will be um, properly initialized when the patch loads. Um, I use this go one message to start these things. These are um, they generate randomized bangs. Um, and this output patch, this is just something that I made for my own use. I don't think anybody needs it. So the final point is that I think it's best to make abstractions for fairly small specific things rather than to try to emulate the user interface of a VST or something like that because I think pure data is not really very well suited to that. Second, I think it's helpful to incorporate idiosyncratic design elements and some degree of modularity to randomize many different aspects of the sound, but it's also important to pay attention to whether or not these things are really working and going in the right direction. I think often it's easy to be overly focused on some sort of conceptual or ideological idea and miss out on maybe the big picture. So. It's important to take a critical look at whether or not something's really working. Um, it's also important to pay attention to control laws and statistical distributions and the way that those things interact. I didn't really go into that very much, but, well, really because these things are specific to whatever you're doing, but things can interact in kind of counterintuitive ways, and if you just go putting things together arbitrarily, they may not really behave optimally. So it's helpful to have a working knowledge of things like statistics. Um, I think sequencers and synthesizers and things like that, drum sounds and so on, probably that should be patched together as needed without trying to make an abstraction that, for example, like a 16-step sequencer, like, an, like a TR-808 or something like that, or something that makes a piano roll, or an elaborate synthesizer. I, I don't think it's that useful to make abstractions for that. It's much more flexible to just patch them together as needed. Um, also, I think it's important to play with things like delay lines, because a lot of interesting things can come out of that. There's a great deal of potential for experimentation there. So I think that's it.